China establishes a three-branch approach to AI governance. Over the past six months, the Chinese government has published a number of documents that taken together constitute a framework for a three-branch approach to AI governance. One, the Cyberspace Administration of China, CAC, develops rules for online algorithms. With a focus on public opinion, they published a draft of 30 rules for regulating internet recommendation algorithms and a more ambitious three-year roadmap for governing all internet algorithms. Examples of rules include a stipulation that recommendation algorithms must, quote, vigorously disseminate positive energy, and a requirement that algorithm providers must be able to, quote, give an explanation and remedy situations in which algorithms have infringed on users' rights and interests. Two, the China Academy of Information and Communications Technology creates tools for testing and certification of trustworthy AI systems. They published the country's first white paper on the topic dealing with more technical aspects of AI governance, such as testing systems for robustness, bias, and explainability. Third, the Ministry of Science and Technology establishes ethics principles to guide AI development and creates review boards within companies and research institutions to overview the implementation of these principles. This approach, exemplified by the 2021 guidelines for universities, labs, and companies, is the least hands-on approach of the three branches. All of these institutions are fairly young, and the ecosystem they make up is continuing to evolve. Wow. I'll go on. Okay, so here's the second one. Robotic Nanny raises mice embryos in artificial wombs. Scientists in Zhengsu province created an AI that can watch over, feed, and monitor the health of embryos as they develop into fetuses in artificial wombs. The AI is equipped with special lenses that enable it to notice minute changes in embryo's development that humans would miss. It closely observes the needs of the embryo in its care, and it can adjust the mix of nutrients and carbon dioxide they receive to improve their environment. The machine can also rank the viability of the embryos it looks after, as well as determine when one has died or become defective. The AI currently monitors mouse embryos, not human ones, as experimenting on a human embryo older than 14 days is a violation of international law. The AI's creators do argue that there is the case for implementing this technology for humans. They say it, quote, would help further understand the origin of life and the embryonic development of humans. And provide a theoretical basis for solving birth defects and other major reproductive health problems. That's the second story. And then I'm just going to conclude here with uh, scientists teach AI prosecutor to charge criminals. Researchers in China's largest district prosecution office, the Shanghai Pudong People's Procuratorate, (laughs) I've never seen that word. Designed an AI capable of filing criminal charges. The research team claims that the AI can file charges with 97% accuracy, given a verbal description of the case. The system was trained to evaluate evidence and conditions for an arrest based on thousands of cases from 2015 to 2020. For now, its area of expertise is limited to Shanghai's eight most commonly prosecuted crimes, credit card fraud, running a gambling operation, dangerous driving, intentional injury, obstructing official duties, theft, fraud, and picking quarrels and provoking trouble, a a catch-all charge often leveled against protesters and activists. The project's lead scientist, Professor Shi Yang, sees the AI as a way to lighten the caseloads of human prosecutors. Quote, 
The system can replace prosecutors in the decision-making process to a certain extent, said she. Okay, well, <laughs> if you were sleepy reading this over your coffee in the morning, you'd be awake by now, I think. <laughs> this is a pretty, pretty mind-boggling stuff. On the first one, I think, well, the Chinese are going to be the Chinese. <laughs> you know, they're going to have a top-down kind of Orwellian system of control over the social and political as well as technological implications of, you know, stuff. And they're on top of it. I mean, I think there are issues with algorithms, aren't they? I mean, they have tremendous power to control how we navigate our experience and interface with this technology of communication and of information gathering. They point us this way or that. We can't be unmindful of that. I mean, that's like something important. I was thinking about I'm teaching my kids in this class I teach free inquiry in the modern world. We read classical texts. So we're reading John Milton, the 17th century English writer and thinker on behalf of not licensing the printing of books. He's talking about the printing of books and he's arguing for the freedom of not licensing. He wants to crown the English government to stay out of the licensing of books. And that's like one of the texts, you know, if you're a freedom of speech, freedom of expression person, that's one of the foundational texts that you go to. And he has a very strong case against, I won't try to reproduce it, the licensing of books. Who will be the people, he asks, who make the decisions, who actually read the books and decide? He says, what do they look like? And he says, a really intelligent person would never take such a job <laughs> as as reading hundreds of pamphlets and thousands of, you know, I mean, that's the kind of bureaucratic job that only an idiot could love. And that would be the person who'd end up deciding <laughs> this kind of thing. But freedom of every man for himself with respect to this or large profit-oriented companies that are, you know, and then maybe they have political judgments that they're imposing on you. So control over the algorithm seems like a reasonable thing to want to do. Right. And since the algorithms are there, I mean, in the West, we don't really have a whole lot of like hands-on censorship, though some of that does happen. You know, YouTube can ban people. Facebook has banned people. But there is a soft kind of tweaking of the thing. And that is going on continuously with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We don't have a kind of clean slate you just get what you've subscribed to. You get these suggestions. Some things are more pronounced. Some things are de-emphasized. It's not licensing, but it's like tailoring what is out there that is happening. And then the question is, who does it and how they do it? And most of it is done not by really humans. It's done by these algorithms. And from what I can tell, like talking to people who work at YouTube, there is not a single individual that clearly knows how exactly the algorithm works. You know, it's a system that you build and tweak and soon enough you can sort of absolve yourself from the responsibility and say, this is just the algorithm. This is, you know. The Chinese want you to give an explanation for situations where the algorithm has infringed mm -hmm. on users' rights and interests. I'm not sure who will decide what that is, but that the algorithmic creator would be required to give an explanation uh, and remedy situations. So this explanation bit, I'm not very well versed in this, but I think this is like a major problem that everybody working in the AI field, in these algorithms field uh, is aware of. And people all over the world are trying to come up with solutions for this. They call it the explainability of the algorithm because building an algorithm that works is easier than building an algorithm that works that can also explain why it works a certain way. Right. Right. When you ask somebody, you know, at Twitter, why is such and such person banned? Right now, I think they would say, well, they must have done something wrong. Like <laughs> the algorithm has decided that what they were posting somehow it went uh, against their policies. There is rarely a very clear explanation. Well, I'm thinking of this in terms of statistical prediction. You could have a lot of data and then you could mine that data in order to be 
able to say what things are associated with what other things, and you could predict. But you might have no idea what the actual mechanism that causes the associations that you've identified to occur. So, for example, you might find that people by race or sexual preference or political affiliation or by aspects of their biophysical, you know, the sound of their voice, the motions of their hands, you might find that that's associated, I guess, something that the uh, prosecutor's story, did we mm-hmm. read the prosecutor's story? We did, yeah. You know, he's going to predict who will be actually guilty of some offense with, you know, information that's associated with it and allows for more accurate prediction than human intuition. I believe that. I'm prepared to believe that readily, that an AI uh, program might be able to more accurately predict an outcome that I care about, an outcome that I, that you know. Mm-hmm. But it may seem unfair somehow if you can't explain it. I see why the explainability, you know, a rationale, a legitimating rationale for the differential cost imposed on people when the predictions of the device are followed. Could a human being arrive at a judgment without having also an explanation for how they arrived at it? And artificial intelligence might never be able to, quote, explain how it arrived. (laughs) Does that sound right to you that humans might never be able to reach a judgment about something without being able to give an account of how it is that they came to that judgment? I think, no, I don't think that's quite right. I think humans come to judgments they can't explain all the time, and they just say, you know, this is just wrong. You know, I just feel it's wrong, and they can't quite explain why. And I think sometimes people can explain why, but the explanation they give is not the actual reason for their argument. But I think the difference here is, in any kind of a a situation of political or social magnitude, a human makes a decision. If you then interrogate them and you say, why did you make this decision? They have to come up with some kind of an explanation. With an AI, it's often currently the case, the way I understand it, is there's just no explanation. The system for how the explanation will be provided is just not there. The, The inner workings of the algorithm are too complex or too abstract for a human to understand. So it strikes me now that something is at stake beyond the immediate effects of applying the algorithm. If we submit habitually to being governed Mm -hmm. by processes that we don't understand, cultivating the habit of, oh, well, it works. I don't know how it works, but it works, is a step into something uh, where you reduce the humanity, you, you kind of regiment. We, we become regimented and almost subordinate. Right. Do you know about the social credit system in China? Not details. Not details. Yeah, me neither. But the basic idea, like, it's this all-encompassing system. Yeah. Everything that you do affects the score that you have, and then the score, in turn, affects what's available to you. And it's like, everything together. You might not be able to travel to a different city if your score is too low. And you don't, the way I understand it, usually you don't really know what affected the score. There's not a whole lot of that explainability coming back to the citizen. So to me, these things put together, the algorithms that don't explain to you their reasoning and how all-encompassing the system might be, I feel about this like it's a a religious kind of situation. Like there's a God, there's a force that you're subordinate to. The force you're supposed to believe is all good and its judgment is always correct and it doesn't have to explain itself to you and it guides your environment the way your environment is going to work and your life is going to play out. Maybe the word is too loud, but it's almost like creating a God creating a a force that is above the human. Well, I'm having a terrible thought. And my terrible thought is that it may be very much more effective at mobilizing a large number of people on behalf of things that are very effective and productive. Uh, It may mean that they are better educated and more able to acquire intellectual development. 
It, it may mean that they are more effective in economic competition and more able to produce at a lower cost. You know, it may work. And one could turn the clock forward 50 years, 75, 150 years, and see there being very different ways of life, you know, that are inexorably in competition with one another, where this individualism, I mean, the idea of the individual, maybe it becomes quaint. Maybe the idea of the individual person, everything to save one life, the infinite value of the individual voice becomes <laughs> almost uh, laughable, almost uh, antique, something from another time, something when people actually believed in freedom. Don't they realize that the web, the, the web of connected and carefully managed and efficiently coordinated human ant colony is more powerful, is stronger, is more robust, is more resilient, is, is more effective, is more competitive, is more dynamic. I mean, it might be like an 18th century idea where you ride on a horse somewhere into an open frontier or you you invent something that in your little cottage laboratory that whatever, it, everybody has their own freedom. I, you know, it may be a very old idea. Maybe the effectiveness of, for example, enduring a pandemic when, you know, the next one might be five times worse. And the difference between countries and their ability to manage the consequences of it instead of it being measured in hundreds of thousands of lives, could be measured in tens of millions of lives. And what about war? I mean, I shudder to even think about it. But again, it requires sacrifice, it requires coordination, it requires mobilization, it requires putting down dissent, it requires single-mindedness of national focus. It requires enduring sacrifice, stifling opposition, getting pointed all in the same direction. Suppose you're not good at that, your, your society. Suppose you've grown into some false sense of security and superiority in your freedom, when in fact, unfreedom is the thing that's going to govern the world in the 22nd century. Maybe that's the future that we face. Grim, bleak, or complete, finally realize the total potential of humanity. After all, we can reproduce embryos. <laughs> Can't you imagine the real consequence? They'll be doing calculus at 10 years old if they manage the development of the human embryo to the precise extent. Those people will be superhuman. <laughs>